Hello everybody, welcome to a brand new episode of Mega Projects. This one all about the F-104 Starfighter, a gloriously named aircraft. But before we get into this, well, this video is brought to you by Keeps. Did you know that two out of every three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? Yes, I did, Keeps. Indeed, I lost my hair by the time I was 25, so that was brilliant. I wish Keeps had been around when I was younger because advances in science have meant that there are now treatments that can combat the symptoms of hair loss and help you keep the hair that you have. Look, it's too late for me. My hair's not coming back, but you didn't have to be like me. You can stop your hair loss early thanks to Keeps. Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA-approved drugs for treating hair loss. So, you may have tried them before, but never at a price this low. And so now you might be thinking, oh my god, Simon, this is medicine. It's gonna be real expensive. But you couldn't be more wrong. Keep starts at just $10 a month. So how does this work? Well, for one thing, you don't need to go to the doctor's office. Just schedule a quick online consult, and a bit later, a discreet package will arrive at your door, and you can use it in the privacy of your own home. Or out in public if you want it, I suppose. You can use it wherever the hell you want. So if you're noticing that you're losing your hair, that's one problem that's not going to fix itself. Do something about it! For a limited time only, go to keeps.com forward slash mega projects or click the link below to receive 50% off your first order. And let's get into today's video. With nicknames like the Missile Winner Manimit, the Flying Coffin, Hooligan, and the Widowmaker, holy shit, the F-105 Lockheed Starfighter was an aircraft with a complex aura to it. A complex aura of death. Complete with a futuristic appearance and a Mach 2, 2,469 kilometers an hour, 1,534 miles an hour top speed, this single-engine supersonic interceptor aircraft was a thunderous piece of military hardware. But below its sleek facade lay numerous problems which became apparent once the United States started exporting the F-104 around the world. The first combat aircraft capable of sustained Mach 2 flight was a plane that traded its searing acceleration and top speed for slack maneuverability and poor range. The F-104 was both a record breaker and an absolute liability. Sometimes an aircraft comes along which redefines aviation, many of which we've covered here on Mega Projects, but the F-104 Starfighter was not one of those aircrafts. It was the equivalent of putting an F-1 engine on the back of a small go-kart and taking it out for a spin. Insanely fast, yes, but also a vehicle that ramped the likelihood of death up just a notch or maybe 12. The story of the F-104 is a bumpy ride with plenty of collisions, and while it won't go down in history, it's still a fascinating tale to tell. In the early 1950s, US pilots were engaged in combat in the skies above Korea, one of the few instances during the Cold War when American and Soviet soldiers actually went head-to-head -head in real combat. The Soviet pilots, along with their North Korean and Chinese counterparts, typically flew the new MiG-15, a tenacious, agile little plane that has since gone on to become one of the most produced aircrafts in history. The Americans countered the M-15 with their North American F-86 Sabre, the country's first swept-wing fighter. But while the F-86 was no slouch, a series of interviews with pilots by Clarence L. Kelly Johnson, Vice President of Engineering and Research at Lockheed Skunk Works, revealed that the American pilots predominantly favored having a smaller, faster aircraft with a higher altitude limit than the F-86. In short, they needed something more like the MiG-15 to successfully tackle the MiG-15. Once back in the US, Johnson and his team set about designing this new aircraft. After studying over 100 different aircraft layouts, the team went for a light 5,400 kilogram, 12,000 pound design with a single General Electric J79 turbojet engine. The US Air Force liked what they saw and invited three other companies, Republic Aviation, North American Aviation, and Northrop Corporation to submit designs for a lightweight fighter. But Lockheed was well ahead at this point, and a contract to build two prototypes was signed on the 12th of March, 1953. Things moved really rapidly, and just shy of a year after the contract was sealed, the first X-104 took to the skies on the 4th of March 1954 at the Edwards Air Force Base in California. At this point, the J-79 engine wasn't ready, so the two XF-104s were instead fitted with a Wright J-65 engine until the more powerful engine was completed. The first flight lasted just 21 minutes, which was less than planned after the aircraft experienced landing gear retraction issues. And look, you'd better get used to the words issues and problems because well, there's plenty more to come today. 
The second prototype was destroyed soon after during a gun-firing trial when the hatch to the ejector seat blew out. As the cockpit depressurized, the pilot ejected, believing the aircraft to be a lost cause. Apparently, that was not the case, though, but let's not be too critical of the pilot sitting inside a faulty metallic experimental rocket, okay? And let's be honest, early testing had been patchy, and along with the J-79 engine swap-out, the new XF-104s came with modified landing gear, modified air intakes, while also being 1.68 meters, that's 5 feet 6 inches longer than the original, to accommodate the new engine. A further 17 aircraft were ordered for testing and began flying on the 17th of February 1956. Between then and the 28th of January 1958, when the first aircraft was delivered into service, they had their airframe strengthened, a ventral fin to improve directional stability at supersonic speed added, along with a boundary layer control system, or BLCS, to reduce landing speed. And with that, this futuristic speedster was ready for takeoff. When the F-104 burst onto the scene, it immediately broke several records and was the first aircraft to simultaneously hold the world speed and world altitude records. On the 7th of May 1958, an F-104 broke the world altitude record for a jet aircraft by flying to 27,811 meters, that's about 91,000 feet, while on the 16th of May 1958, the world flight airspeed record tumbled when a starfighter hit 2,259 kilometers an hour or 1,404 miles an hour above Edwards Air. Force Base. In 1959, the altitude record was again smashed, with an F-104 climbing to 31,513 meters, that's 103,000 feet, followed by several unofficial flights over the following years, where the aircraft was said to hit a final height of 36,800 meters, or 121,000 feet, and by the way, that's 270 Empire State Buildings stacked on top of each other. At that height, you're also well into the atmospheric zone, known as the stratosphere. Add to this some quite astonishing time-to-climb records, culminating in a 30,000 meter, 98,400 feet record of 904.92 seconds in 1959. And you might be forgiven for thinking that the greatest aircraft the world had ever seen had finally arrived, but as we'll come to see in just a moment, speed is definitely not everything. This merciless speed demon came with an airframe constructed of duralumin along with some stainless steel and titanium. It had a rather radical trapezoidal wing design, a straight-edged and tapered wing layout that was swept back 26 degrees. The tips of these wings ended in a razor-sharp 0.4 mm edge that proved so dangerous for ground crews that the US Air Force mandated that protective guards be installed as soon as the aircraft landed. The thickness of the wings was also the reason that the fuel needed to be carried within the fuselage and why the plane's landings were initially at speeds that would terrify even the most seasoned of pilots, around 287 to 296 kilometers an hour, and that's about 178 to 184 miles per hour. It wasn't until the addition of the BLCS that this monster was brought under some resemblance of control while landing. It had a wingspan of 6.63 meters, that's 21 feet 9 inches, and a total length of 16.6 meters, about 54 feet 8 inches, making it considerably smaller than modern examples. The General Electric J79 turbojet came with 10,000 pound force of thrust and 15,600 pound force with afterburner, which is much less than what we have today, but as we've seen, easily enough to shatter speed records left, right, and center. Thanks to the aircraft's excellent thrust to drag ratio, the F 104 was capable of exceeding Mach 2, 2,459 kilometers an hour, and that's 1,529 miles per hour, but it had a nasty habit of overheating the engine, so its operational speed was limited to Mach 2. The F-104 was the first aircraft to use the 20mm M61 Vulcan autocannon with a 6,000 rounds per minute firing rate, meaning the F-104 would be out of ammo after just 7 seconds of continuous fire. The aircraft could also carry two AIM-9 Sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles on the wingtip stations, though it was later modified to include underwing pylons for additional armaments and a centerline pylon capable of carrying a nuclear weapon. Another radical design feature of the F-104 was the ejector seat. Now, I don't know about you, but I've always assumed that an ejecting pilot would fly upwards, but not with the early versions of this revolutionary little aircraft. Its downward-firing ejection seat did exactly as it sounds, which, as you might imagine, caused all manner of problems for low-level ejections. <laughs> so, bang! Straight into the ground! 
This format was used because there were limitations of the available ejection seat catapults at the time, and an astonishing 21 USAF pilots failed to escape safely because of this, including Ivan Kinshalo Jr., the first person to perform a suborbital space flight when his Bell X2 rocket plane reached 38,470 meters, that's 126,000 feet, in 1956, before being killed after ejecting from an F-104 in 1958. Not long after, the aircraft was fitted with the Lockheed C-2 upward-firing seat instead, and the concept of downward ejector seat fell completely out of fashion for good reason. When the F-104 entered full service in 1958, it immediately experienced problems, namely with the J-79 engine and the M-61 cannon. These were deemed so significant that the entire fleet was grounded just three months into their fledgling careers. New J-79 GE-3B engines and three additional ADC units were installed. These small air data computers were used to compile data from the aircraft systems to determine the calibrated airspeed, Mach number, altitude, and much more. While these upgrades didn't fix all of the F-104's problems, they certainly made the aircraft easier to fly. But while the F-104 was receiving a much-needed structural facelift, the US Air Force was already having second thoughts. Just to show how quickly the times changed regarding military technology, the trend was already beginning to shift towards aircraft with much longer range that could carry considerably more weapons. The F-104, with its fairly limited arsenal and paltry combat range of 680 kilometers, that's 420 miles, had neither, and before it had even had a chance to dance, it was being ditched for younger, better models. The initial USAF order of 722 was slashed to just 170, while after less than a year in service, the F-104s were transferred from the fighter interceptor squadrons to the three squadrons of the Air National Guard. This is the equivalent of playing for the Yankees one day, and the next day the Scranton Wilkes Bar Rail Riders. If you've Never heard of them? Well, that's exactly my point. Despite the F-104 appearing to be on the brink of an early extinction, it was used in several roles sporadically until 1969. In 1958, they were used during the Taiwan Straits Crisis when several 104s flew back and forth between Taiwan and mainland China as a way of flexing U.S. muscle and also lending support to the breakaway island. Three years later, they were once again used as a deterrent when they took part in maneuvers during the Berlin Crisis of 1961 in which Soviet leaders delivered an ultimatum for all NATO troops and aircraft to leave the German capital. Not one to back down from a fight, JFK ordered more aircraft to the city, with the USAF said to be pleasantly surprised with the performance of the F-104, which outmaneuvered every aircraft in the vicinity. Suddenly, there was a bit of hope for the starfighters. The performance in Berlin led to a call-up a few years later during the Vietnam War, where they were used in air superiority and air support roles. Essentially, they were there to protect other aircraft, in particular the F-105 Thunder Chief and the EC-121D Warning Star Airborne Early Warning Aircraft. The F-104 performed admirably in Southeast Asia, but were rarely involved in aerial combat and left Vietnam without any recorded air-to-air -air kills with a loss of 14 starfighters. This was the last U.S. combat operation that they were involved in, and in 1967, the units began to be replaced with the McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom II. Two years later, the last F-104 left the U.S. Air Force, 11 years after their introduction. While the use of the F-104 under the Stars and Stripes had been fairly limited, it saw considerably wider use when it was exported abroad and considerably higher levels of controversy. A consortium of Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Italy, along with manufacturers within each country, signed a contract to begin constructing a modified F-104 for the European crowd. This new aircraft, the F-104G, consisted of a more powerful engine, additional skin panels, and reinforced landing gear with larger tires and improved brakes. It also came with a more advanced radar system System, electronic de-icing equipment for the air intake inlets, a larger drag chute, and an increased weapon capacity, now at 1,400 kilograms, 3,000 pounds. In total, 17 separate companies were involved in manufacturing the F-104G in Europe. And, well, this is where the story of the F-104 begins to take a bit of a nosedive. Things started out as bad as they possibly could in Germany when, in June 1962, four F-104Gs crashed in formation while practicing for an air display, destroying all the aircraft and killing all four pilots. And sadly, that was just the start. 
Much has been said about just why the accident rates in Europe were so high. Was it because of the bad weather compared to the frequent clear sky climates that many pilots trained in in Arizona? Was it because European pilots had not kept pace with jet fighter developments? Or was it simply because the F-104 could be a maniacal bucking bronco? The reason was almost certainly a combination of all three, which led to a staggering 292 crashes and 116 German pilots lost to F-104 accidents. Germany, Belgium, and Canada all experienced between 32 and 46% losses of their F-104s during their decades in service, which is shocking, but they were the extremes. Denmark, Japan, and Norway suffered losses of between 14 and 24%, while the Spanish Air Force came out with a perfect record of zero losses. It's not immediately clear why there were such disparities between loss rates, but what was clear was that the Starfighter had the ignoble honor of having some of the highest loss rates of any aircraft in history. And here's the final kicker. In 1976, news broke that Lockheed had paid $22 million, that's around $190 million today, in bribes to foreign officials as part of the F-104G deals in Europe. Things worsened when it was revealed that in 1962, documents relating to the transaction had all been destroyed in Germany, where officials were said to have taken $10 million, $85 million today, in bribes in return for signing contracts for 900 F-104Gs in 1961. As scandal erupted, officials in Japan, Italy, the Netherlands, and Saudi Arabia were also implicated, leading to Lockheed Chairman of the Board Daniel Horton and President Karl Kochian resigning on the 13th of February 1976. The aircraft that the German public had dubbed the Widowmaker for quite obvious reasons now found itself at the center of one of the largest scandals in aviation history. So what can you say about the F-104? If you just started watching this video in the last couple of minutes, you might well assume that this was the worst aircraft of all time, but that would certainly be going too far. The F-104 was incredible with certain aspects of flying, namely acceleration, top speed, and altitude limit, but far from exemplary when it came to its large turn radius, short range, small armament capacity, erratic pitch behavior, and the requirements for it to remain at full speed while landing. This was a combination of positives and negatives that didn't particularly fit well together, and when you take into consideration the huge demand it often placed on inexperienced pilots, it's not hard to see why this ferocious little plane caused so much carnage. The F-104 seemed to have different problems throughout its life, from oscillations causing uncontrolled dives, T-tail fluttering which occasionally tore off the tail, and problems with the brand new engine in the early days, to issues with the variable thrust nozzle that could cause a sudden loss of thrust, afterburner blowout, and problems integrating into different air forces later on. This was an aircraft that was just plagued from the very start. But as we saw earlier, this was also an aircraft that shattered records when it broke onto the scene. The F-104 may not hold a place in the hallowed Aviation Hall of Fame, but it unquestionably played its role in the development of aviation. Sometimes you need to learn what not to do before the right path becomes clear. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. If you've got a suggestion for a future Mega Projects video, please do leave it in the comments below. I often look to those for new ideas, so please have a go at that, and thank you for watching.